This is your reality check. Welcome to The Reality Check, the weekly Canadian show that explores a wide range of controversies and curiosities using science and critical thinking. I'm producer Pat, and with me is Christina Roach. Hey, everyone. We have two interesting segments for you today. Adam looks at the science, or lack thereof, (laughs) in the movie Moonfall. But first, Christina, you're going to talk to us about Slapgate. (laughs) Yeah. Slapgate. Now, if you didn't get enough hot takes on what happened at the Oscars a couple of weeks ago, welcome. Since there are wonderful humans who listen to our podcast all around the world, some of you may not be up to speed with Slapgate. Here's an overview. The Academy Awards, commonly known as the Oscars, aired March 27th. The Oscars is a highly regarded prestigious award given out for artistic and technical merit in the film industry. Now, this year's co-host was comedy legend Chris Rock, who Pat and I have seen live, what, maybe four or five times over the years, Pat? Yeah, probably that. I don't watch the Oscars. I honestly don't care much about award shows as a rule. And I know if something noteworthy happens, I'll hear all about it the next day. Well, (laughs) I checked my phone. Woo! Twitter notifications were on fire. I saw a few different tweets with some iteration of, what the F just happened or what the f did i just witness so of course i was curious as to what the f happened in short chris rock made a joke about actor will smith's wife jada's shaved hairstyle referencing the movie gi jane where demi moore famously shaved her head for the role something considered pretty bold at the time by an actress in the movie biz it seemed like a pretty innocuous joke as we know when a comedian hosts an awards show like Ricky Gervais, who is ruthless. They poke fun at the celebs in the audience. But Jada had recently publicly acknowledged that she has alopecia, the medical term for baldness. So the joke didn't go over well with her. After making the joke, Will Smith got up, walked up on the stage towards Ruck. Now, first, it really does look like a bit or an improvised moment that could have actually been really funny. Chris Rock is like, "Uh uh-oh, and smiling, as I'm sure he, along with everyone else watching, thought Will Smith was going to do something funny in defense of his wife. I don't know, put Chris in a headlock, put up his fists in a boxing stance as a throwback to him playing Muhammad Ali, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. What no one saw coming was a hard slap across Rock's face. Now, while my brain was trying to figure out what I just saw in the video, I thought this might be a bit, until I saw how Rock reacted afterwards, and especially when Smith returned to his seat, he seemed completely unhinged, just over-the-top angry. He was yelling at Rock, keep my wife's name the F out of your mouth. Now, they cut to commercial in the U.S. apparently, but in countries like Australia, TV viewers could watch the unfortunate event play out, and that footage quickly made it to the internet. The Oscar audience's confusion and shock is palpable in that video. Now, this is TRC, so this isn't going to be your typical hot take. We are on a fact-checking, myth-busting mission, my friends. After this incident, conspiracy theories started floating around, because of course they did. Some people were convinced this whole thing was staged for publicity, which I totally get. I work in the music industry, enough said. But one of the more ridiculous headlines I saw circulating suggested that Chris Rock was wearing a prosthetic cheek pad. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And the crack internet sleuths have zoomed in photo evidence to prove it. Here's the Snopes headline. Was Chris Rock wearing protective cheek pad before Will Smith slap? I thought this was so silly that it really wasn't worth talking about here. But after some digging, I found legit articles in outlets like Reuters and Gizmodo compelled to debunk it. And in Gizmodo's case, pointing out the dangers of photo enhancing apps. So my first reaction, like many of you hearing this, was how in the hell can a prosthetic cheek pad protect you from getting hard slapped in the face? (laughs) Seriously. At its core, again, it's just so silly. But as writer Matt Novak says in his Gizmodo feature, it had to be true because nothing is real anymore, right? One Facebook poster said, if you think the slap was real, then why is Chris Rock wearing a prosthetic pad on his cheek? Plus his hands are behind his back and he leans forward. Fake, fake, fake. All for ratings. 
Another tweet from at Viral Clips reads, In 8K quality images, you can see a pad on Chris Rock's cheek. Yeah, conspiracy theorists gonna go crazy with this one. These posts include the zoomed-in photo of Rock's face pre-slap. That so clearly looks doctored or photoshopped, I honestly fear for humanity if this is where we're at. But wait! Other conspiracy theorists, or just straight-up trolls, posited, what if these media outlets and photo agencies are in on the conspiracy? So this is what we refer to in our biz as a stretch. (laughs) Not to mention the fallout from this incident has had some really serious negative repercussions on Will Smith's career and future projects. Let's look at the simplest and most likely explanation of what's going on here. That viral image was photoshopped, plain and simple. Or someone used an AI photo enhancer app like Ramini on the original image. Now, I'd never heard of Ramini. Have you heard of that app, Pat? I haven't, no. It's a phone app that lets people, quote unquote, scale up an image. So this app, amongst others, takes an existing photo that may be pixelated or low res, and it tries to guess at how to make the image better. As Novak explains, it adds data rather than extrapolating from what's there, which can lead to ignorant internet sleuths misunderstanding how this software works. Pat, you're a Photoshop guy. You have more than a passing understanding of how image editing software works. Right. So I think that Google Brain has come some way towards this, but uh, it's all predictive, right? Like They're just trying to predict how to fill in the spaces. Mm -hmm. You're always going to have artifacts as a result of that. Well, you and I typically joke. I mean, we've seen this in cop shows or movies where they're enhanced. And like in Super Troopers where they're enhancing the most pixelated image. And then all of a sudden you can see the person, you know, in in just like clear high-res quality. It's just ridiculous. Gizmodo even took a low-res version of a photo of Rock's face post-slap themselves. They ran it through a free iPhone version of Romini. And it seems to interpret the face wrinkles, and it kind of fills in the blanks, making it seem like there's this kind of weird flap of fake skin sitting on his face. The process also changed Rock's skin tone on that cheek. So just go and check out the links that I have in the show notes, and you'll see those A-B comparisons in their article. And that'll uh, give you some context for what I'm saying. How some people became convinced this cheek pad photo was real is honestly beyond me. Another clue, as Reuters points out, if you look at photos shot of Rock earlier in the evening, he clearly has beard stubble on his face. And in these supposed cheek pad photos, he doesn't. So, hmm. I was trivial as this whole event seems in context to tragic goings on in the world. It's unfortunately a sign of a much bigger and, in my mind, scarier problem. The more technology evolves that can manipulate video and photos and audio in such convincing ways can be so dangerous. And it underscores the importance and impetus of what we do here on this podcast. I'm sure many of you have varying strong opinions about what went down, especially in terms of how the award show handled the incident after it happened. Or many of you just don't care. I fall into the latter category. (laughs) Yes, you've been saying, I don't care since it happened. But I'll just say as an old school Will Smith fan who grew up with Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, it was shocking and dismaying to watch unfold. Smith was favored to win the Oscar for Best Actor, which he did. And this was supposed to be the biggest night of his career. Not to mention Rock was essentially assaulted in front of millions of people while doing his job. Now, Rock has spoken openly in recent years about being relentlessly bullied in school. This was not a good look. Will this ultimately be a boost for his career? Sure. He was widely lauded for how calmly he handled the incident and resale tickets for his stand-up shows after the Oscars jumped from 46 bucks to around $350, Ooh. which is, wait, with some reportedly selling on StubHub from $444 to $1,700. I still bet he wishes it never happened, though. I bet you he does. And, not going to lie, I can't wait for that next stand-up special where he finally addresses all of this. (laughs) Well, thanks for that, Christina. And with that, we will turn things over to Adam. I hope everyone out there is staying safe and healthy, and we will talk to you soon. Stay classy, not smart-assy.
What's up, cuboids? I recently watched the movie Moonfall, and I just had to talk about it for the show. It's Roland Emmerich's latest science fiction disaster movie. As some of you may know, I'm a fan of some of his films, mainly Independence Day. I belong in the air, as one might say. This movie was released in January in theaters, but it's already available to buy digitally. I watched it on Amazon Prime. It was included with my subscription. You may be able to do the same. I'm not sure what it's like in other markets, but you can find it if you are so inclined. Now, this segment will include spoilers for the movie. I'll try not to spoil on purpose, but just to talk about it, it's going to be necessary. So if you're interested in watching it spoiler free, I would suggest you pause, go watch the movie and then come back and listen to the segment. Now, at first, this seems like it's obviously a very silly movie and it must have terrible science, right? The plot is basically something happens to the moon, which causes it to fall towards the earth and all sorts of bad things happen. So Roland Emmerich has a bad habit of endorsing pseudoscience, conspiracy theories, and and putting very bad science in his films. So Stargate, for example, one of his early movies... Uh, Seems to just be a a, a harmless science fiction movie, but it's based on the unfounded belief that many real people believe that is that the pyramids were built by aliens. Independence Day is also about aliens, but it's sort of your standard alien invasion movie. It's not based on any particular pseudoscience aside from, you know, aliens came to Earth and crashed in Area 51 and things like that. The movie 10,000 BC suggests that the pyramids were built much earlier than they actually were by a civilization which didn't really exist at the time. It suggested again that there may have been aliens involved and there's a bunch of other anachronisms in the film that couldn't really have happened 10,000 years ago. The movie 2012 is about the end of the world and it's based on the Mayan end of the world conspiracies. We've talked a lot about those on the show uh, about 10 years ago. Now, I haven't seen a Shakespeare movie. It's based on this idea that Shakespeare didn't really write Shakespeare, whatever that's about. And of course, the biggest fake movie that he ever made was The Day After Tomorrow, which suggests that climate change is real. That was a joke. Climate change is very real. It would not happen as depicted in the movie, though. So he's terrible and this movie's dumb, right? Well, arguably, but I was surprised to learn that there were actually a lot of scientific consultants for this movie. So I'll often watch a science fiction movie and I'll wonder, didn't they have someone with like basic high school science literacy to correct some of the mistakes, right? Someone in craft services would come out and say, actually, I actually paid attention in school and and that that doesn't make sense. Could could you maybe not do that? Um, So we want filmmakers to get someone who actually knows the science to help them correct sort of the bigger errors. Um, And it seems that this was somewhat done in this movie. So it does sort of cover some actually interesting things that might happen if the outlandish premise was true. Uh, And then there's some other smaller things that I think the movie still got a little wrong. So first, let's get this conspiracy theory out of the way. In this case, the basic pseudoscientific concept behind the movie is the moon is a megastructure. So what does that mean? Basically, the, the moon is fake. It's a huge spaceship that was built by aliens. It has a hollow core. It has a white dwarf star at its center to power it. The moon isn't falling towards the earth because it's been nudged in any way. It's falling towards the earth because an evil AI is restricting the moon's power source. So it, it just falls. But it's easy enough to just accept that that's the plot of the movie. That's that's the whole point of the movie. So I'm not going to nitpick that specific idea. As with other Roland Emmerich movies, um, this isn't something that he personally made up for the film. Um, it's a thing that some people do actually believe. So many people will make claims about the moon not weighing enough for its size or the coincidence about its distance from the earth making it perfectly cover the sun in an eclipse or some some odd coincidences like that that don't really make sense. And an explanation is that it's a mega structure built by aliens or something like that. Fandom.com talked to astrophysicist Kathy Romer from the UK's University of Sussex about the film, and she said that no, the moon is not hollow. So basically, we know its distance from the Earth with with, with a lot of accuracy. We know its mass. We know it has a solid core. There's no indication that it's hollow, as many people say. Roland Emmerich was inspired to make this film after reading the nonfiction nonfiction said loosely, book Who Built the Moon? That's a 2006 work written by Christopher Knight and Alan Butler, which suggests that the moon is, as they call it in the film, a megastructure. Megastructure just means big structure, but it means it was built, basically. So I won't take this entire segment to discuss this idea, but needless to say, 
I don't believe the moon is fake. There's probably a whole other segment that we could do on that. If it was hollow, the amount of pressure would be considerable, which of course can be explained away by saying that some very advanced alien race or their AI super robots uh, actually built it. So the concept of a megastructure itself is not that bad. This is uh, the kind of thing that scientists actually look for. A Dyson sphere, for example, is a star surrounded by a ring or a sphere which captures some or all of the solar energy emitted by the star. So one such design would have the radius of the sphere be the size of the distance uh, from the sun to the earth so that the entire surface could be a massive habitable area. So if we were able to somehow have such an engineering feat in our solar system, you could have basically a huge amount of land uh, this way. So the moon in the film Moonfall houses a, a white dwarf inside of it. Does this make sense? Well, in the movie, the white dwarf isn't that big. A smaller white dwarf would need to be heavier. That's kind of how it works. Professor Katie Romer does some math here to suggest that a white dwarf that would fit in the moon would be the mass of the sun. So if something so massive really was at the center of the fake moon that was in orbit around the Earth, so assuming that it was sort of small enough uh, to fit, then its mass would still be so big that the moon's gravity would be much greater than the Earth's. So the Earth would actually be rotating around the moon, not the other way around, and at our distances it would need to be doing so very fast. Now the movie sort of claims that the moon's mass changes and suggests perhaps some advanced technology could be at play here. And I quote from the movie, the moon doesn't have enough gravity to do that. And then the conspiracy theorist uh, turned uh, astronaut turned savior of humanity says, you're dealing with a megastructure. Your rules don't apply. Okay. So, so, so the gravity is different. Sure. So this is sort of a hand waving explanation to say that in the many cases of the moon's gravity or mass not making sense in the movie, the sort of sci-fi explanation uh, would be that maybe there's advanced technology, all those AI nanobot swarm things seem to move without reaction mass, there doesn't seem to be normal physics involved, so perhaps modifying gravity and mass are just par for the course. Maybe I'm being a bit charitable, but it's a movie, it's part of the premise, I'll accept it. Now, another issue with the white dwarf is the amount of radiation that it's producing. So the gamma rays and x-rays would heat the inside of the moon, the fake moon structure that's <laughs> that's in the air. Uh, and in one scene, the protagonists get to the center of the moon and they look at the white dwarf with their bare eyes. So even before looking it up, I was thinking like this, this is probably dangerous. They're probably getting cancer or being blind. So there might be some shielding on the glass uh, of their ship, but it seems like staring at the sun from closer than Mercury. All right, so what did all the scientists do here? Well, NASA was consulted, uh, and you might ask for what, and th this kind of works in many ways. So NASA is represented in the movie, so NASA generally is consulted to sign off on how they are portrayed in the movie. So this could be all sorts of things that I imagine includes things like having the jobs make sense, maybe make the badges and uniforms and outfits look right, things like that. One person who helped with the film was Jim Green, a former NASA employee who worked on films like The Martian, which is a movie that got more things accurate. I wouldn't say everything, but it, it did a better job probably. So he made suggestions about how the Earth and Moon interact and what disastrous consequences might occur if the Moon's orbit actually changed and it fell closer to the Earth. He suggested, for example, that the Moon would move more quickly as it fell, and that happens in the movie, that it would create massive tides, volcanic activity, and this also happens in the film. So it's like, you know, you can imagine the writers hearing this like, oh yeah, we can do all this in the movie, great disaster stuff, it'll be kind of like 2012. I recall discussing this with Phil Plate, the bad astronomer, many years ago at TAM, and he basically said that when you actually talk to scientists about the ideas for your movie, they'll actually give you really cool and interesting ideas of things you could incorporate into the film. And I, I totally agreed with that point of view. In this case, to some extent, it sounds like they did attempt to do that. So good on them for that. So the main idea of the movie is arguably impossible. The moon doesn't keep its orbit because it's powered by some engine. It has angular momentum and the gravity between the Earth and the Moon makes makes it orbit the Earth, just like all planets in our solar system orbit the Sun and, and Moon's orbit around those planets. There's sort of a steady state that, that uh, it settles into there. Like I mentioned, there's this idea of the Moon's mass changing in the film, so that could supposedly be a factor. Um, obviously, if, if the Moon's mass went up or down, it, it would change how it would orbit. And if the moon kept a consistent mass, then it would just keep going where it's going for millions and millions of years. 
So the gravity being weird is sort of a big thing in the movie. The idea is interesting and it's kind of the source of the disaster, but I had a bit of an issue with how it was sometimes portrayed. So roughly, the idea is the moon is so close to the earth that its gravitational pull is affecting things uh, more strongly. So all sorts of weird things are happening. So the moon does affect the earth and we see that in tides, but we don't see it in, in sort of massive things. So we can think about what this might actually do, and some of that happens in the movie, and some of it doesn't make a ton of sense. So there's a scene early on where some characters see a rolling chair slide across the room, and this is because the moon is is rising. So the idea is the moon is pulling on the chair. Pretty extreme, of course, but if the effect was that pronounced, perhaps this would make sense. But the humans observing this would would themselves sense a shift in gravity. So they they would probably be tilted a bit away from the chair if the chair is being pulled away, right? Just think of the whole room um, shifting um, or being uh, the floor being diagonal. That's essentially what would happen. But for a chair uh, with with wheels to roll slightly, that could happen with a floor that's almost flat and the people might not actually notice if it wasn't that pronounced. But this is sort of where the difference between tidal forces and and the gravitational pull on on individual items comes in. The reason for tides isn't because uh, any small amount of water would be pulled up that much. So if you put a glass of water on a table next to a shore, um, the water in the glass doesn't fly out as high as the tides would if the tides go up like a foot or something like that. So the tides change drastically as the moon exerts a small force on all the water in the ocean and it pulls it up and it kind of bulges a bit. So there's a big difference in the tides in the ocean, but you're not going to see that difference um, in something like a lake and you're definitely not going to see it in a cup and you're not going to see it on yourself. I'm not going to weigh myself when the moon's up on top of me and weigh a lot less than than when it's not. Uh, It's not something that you'd be able to detect. So when the moon gets closer and closer, the tidal forces can get huge, but that doesn't mean that things will start floating away. It doesn't mean that the moon's pull on individual items will be so strong that they'd they'd be gone because those tidal forces would be just way huger. So let's assume that the moon's gravity in the film is still about the same with one-sixth gravity on the surface. Even if the moon is right on top of you and it's close enough to touch you, then the moon would be pulling you upwards with one-sixth of Earth's gravity the Earth is still pulling you down one full gravity. So you'd be weighing five-sixths of the weight that you normally would. A little lighter, but you wouldn't be flying away. The film depicts streams of water leaving the ocean, all sorts of things flying away because of the gravitational forces of the moon. How does this really make sense? So even if the gravity of the moon was much greater than one-sixth of the Earth's gravity, it should be consistent. You wouldn't expect to see streams of water. You would expect to see all of the water of the ocean just spill out like it was poured out of a bucket. And it might like group together and make these big bubbles or something cool like that. You would see tides, of course. You would see waves, of course. But you wouldn't see streams like this. And in one scene, we have a character being pulled sideways by the gravity of the moon. But then right next to him, the people that are trying to help, they're standing upright and pulling that person back. So that it just doesn't make any sense, right? So you're, you're thinking of a force kind of like how wind acts, but not how gravity actually acts because those, those two other people would, would also be pulled with the exact same strength. So any sort of gravitational pull so strong that things would become weightless and start to actually be pulled away from the surface of the earth would mean that like everything would start flying into space. Bridges and other structures, they're made to be under constant gravitational force with things sort of pushing on them. They're not made to to withstand a force from beneath. So all sorts of really odd things would happen if that was actually the case. Sand would come right off the beach. Dirt would be ripped out of the ground. Uh, things would just would just fall apart. So I had some other minor issues with some of the technology ideas in the film that seemed a bit implausible. Some of this just for movie reasons, but whatever. So without any ability to get to the moon, they recommission a space shuttle, which was in a museum. <laughs> so it seems like it would take a significant time to get that space shuttle ready. But in the movie, they do it in no time at all. The prep times are wild. At one point, like, the shuttle's almost ready to go. And they decide, oh, well, we're in a bit of a rush, so we need to launch in 28 minutes. And they just go. And I think, obviously, that's a little unrealistic. The shuttle loses an engine, so it launches with only two of its three engines. And they're able to do this because of, like, the pull of the moon reducing gravity, basically. And, and I suspect this would have some balance issues or some other uh, some other effects. And as the, the moon is close... We're able to see all these other objects floating away around the shuttle. And then the shuttle's like blasting full force to get away. Well, 
if 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 the water next to the shuttle is being pulled towards the moon, the the shuttle wouldn't even need to use its rockets. It could just it would just float. It would just float to the moon. Of course, then it would nosedive into the surface of the moon with a lot of force and it would be disastrous and they wouldn't be able to save the earth. Another odd technology uh, thing occurred when Halle Berry's boss, he quits on the spot. He gives her his smart card. It's like his ba- his badge access card. Um, and he, he says, basically, that's that's all the clearance you need. So you can go look up all the NASA secret files on the mega structure. So I have a very similar smart card for my work. It has a chip in it that looks a lot like the chip uh, on the card in the movie. I use it to access my computer, uh, use uh, various IT systems that are protected B and stuff like that. So you can't just use this kind of card and have access to anything that a person would have access to. It's usually two-factor authentication, which means you plug in the card to a reader of some kind. You got to put in your own password to go with the with the card. So so Halle Berry, she just walks around. She shows the card to Donald Sutherland, and uh, she tells him, "Well, you know, I was given this, and it's okay. I have access." You're just fine with giving her all the files she wants, and it's it's all very poor security because anyone could just steal someone's card, uh, just just rip it right off them or kill them and steal their card and they could have access to all the very top secret files that they want. So at this point, Halle Berry learns about what really happened during the two minutes of silence during the Apollo 11 mission. And this again is a real life conspiracy theory. There were two minutes of radio silence during the mission, which conspiracy theorists used to speculate about all sorts of things that they found, such as aliens or in the case of Moonfall, evidence of the moon being a megastructure. So apparently NASA knew all this time. Now there's some other technology issues, such as a character using a smartphone with a touchscreen while wearing a spacesuit. <laughs> so it seems possible that a modern spacesuit might be equipped um, with something to use uh, the phone's touchscreen. But in the movie, they're wearing Apollo era spacesuits because they can't have any electronics because of some plot device. So using a smartphone with those spacesuits uh, seems like it would be like trying to use a smartphone with oven mitts or something like that. I do not think it would work, but that's that's maybe a minor thing. And finally, there's this whole subplot about an EMP being used to stop the uh, evil alien AI robots, which are in the moon. So for one, if they're really advanced, I would hope that they would be able to be hardened against EMP. There's ways to make technology hardened against them. Maybe they're dumb, but there's there's this race where the good guys try to set off the EMP before, you know, some other bad guys try to basically use their backup plan, which is to nuke the moon. <laughs> so they want to send some nuclear bombs to the moon to set off a nuclear explosion. So they can't fire ICBMs to the moon because they're, they're short range. And that's fair because IC- ICBM stands for intercontinental ballistic missile and not interplanetary <laughs> ballistic missile. But one of the things which produces an EMP is a nuclear detonation. The moon eventually gets close enough to the Earth uh, for the ICBMs to be able to reach it. It's basically like touching the atmosphere. And if they did this at the right distance, they should have been able to set off a nuke um, in the Earth's atmosphere over the surface of the moon, and then it would be able to kill the alien uh, nanobot swarm. So in the movie, they're worried about the fallout and stuff like that, but they've done these kind of um, high altitude detonations uh, when they did one, it caused some blackouts in Hawaii, but that that's, that's how you can produce an EMP. If someone did this, obviously over like North America, it would knock out all our computers it would be very bad. That's the plot of the TV show, Dark Angel. But, uh, in the movie that should have been a viable solution to stop the evil aliens. So I could go on and on about this movie. There are probably some other criticisms that I could think of, but I think I've talked enough about it. Moonfall was a decently entertaining movie. It has some interesting character drama, though it pales in comparison to films like Independence Day. The disaster scenarios are fun, and more than a lot of films, they are somewhat based on sound science. The movie's a bit silly, of course, and some of the specific science is flawed, as I mentioned, but the overall ideas, if you can accept the basic plot of aliens having built the moon, then they, they do have some scientific validity and reason to them. The idea of what they did here is good, so engaging with scientists, using those conversations and concepts to lead to more interesting scenes in the film, makes a more entertaining product than just going with an completely implausible concept and not really asking anyone to verify that it makes any sense. Peace out, cuboids. For show notes or to discuss this episode, visit our Facebook page and website at trcpodcast.com. For general inquiries or to send a topic or parody suggestion, email info at trcpodcast.com. Help support the show by leaving a review on iTunes and liking us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at TRC underscore podcast. Oh.
takes. Stuart can correct me on, on anything I got totally wrong there. Um... Stuart Robbins is going to have a field day with this episode. <laughs>